Hello and good afternoon or good morning for our friends in the US and welcome everyone to this webinar on the implications of the US 2020 election for the European Union by the Wilfrid Martin Center in cooperation with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy of Tufts University in the US. I'm Roland Freudenstein, Policy Director of the Martin Center. And dare I say it, it's a timely debate. Anyway, thanks for joining us. I think our topic doesn't need much introduction, but our speakers may. So here we go. We have Jana Pulierin from Berlin, the head of the European Council on Foreign Relations Office there. We've got Max Bergman, who is senior fellow of the Center for American Progress in Washington. Dare I say, it's a liberal think tank. Um, and we have Konstantin Arvanitopoulos, Professor Konstantin Arvanitopoulos, who is Professor of International Politics at the Karaman List Chair in Hellenic and European Studies at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and also a Senior Research Associate of the Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies. So, um, first we'll talk a little bit about the uh, evolving election result itself, about the election, and then we're going to take it to transatlantic questions such as what does all this mean for the European Union, how is US policy towards Europe going to develop, and what will be the uh, overriding topics in transatlantic relations. Um, some household rules. Uh, let's make this a debate, a real debate with short contributions and the possibility to react upon each other. The audience, welcome everyone, uh, can ask questions or make short comments, in fact, via the chat function on Facebook. And if it gets boring, I'll take the liberty of morphing into anyone from Matt Karnichnik to Bruno Le Maire to Sergei Karaganov just to spice it up a little. So be prepared for this. Okay, let's cut to the chase and start with Max. Uh, Max, can you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the eminent question of why so many opinion pollsters had it wrong? Over to you. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a fantastic question. I guess my initial take uh, is that they once again <laughs> seem to undercount uh, support for Donald Trump, uh, particularly in rural areas. Uh, I think the thing that we have to look at with this election is it was an extremely high turnout election. Uh, I think my back of the envelope calculations, if I m remember correctly, is that if you look at you know Florida, for instance, where Trump sort of increased his his vote share uh, compared to four years ago, uh, he also he increased uh, his number of votes by about seven hundred fifty thousand. Uh, while Biden increased his vote share on top of Hillary Clinton by 500,000. And you sort of look at that throughout, you know, I think Michigan, uh, Biden added more votes than Trump, but Trump also added more votes to himself. So I think one of the things that pollsters undercounted, uh, probably in the neighborhood of four to 5%, uh, was support for Trump. And so what all that means is that if you have a poll that shows that uh, Biden was ahead by eight points in nationally, well, it's probably going to be about four to five points uh, nationally. And then if you had him, you know, I think where some of the bigger polling errors was in places like Wisconsin, where it seemed that it, he was up by eight or nine points, uh, yet it's going to be well, less than 1% or Biden was up by eight or nine points, and it's going to be a less than 1% result. So I think, you know, it's hard to count uh, to project what the turnout's going to be, but I think there was an undercounting of, of Trump vote. I also think there was a bit of an undercounting of the of how well Trump would do, uh, and, and, and by well, I mean small margins, but do well with populations like Hispanics and, and African Americans. So that to me looks like the 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 major rationale of why there was some under, undercounting. You know, I think it's still very early. Votes are still being tabulated, so we'll sort of get truer margins. Um, but in general, I think. We thought this was, I think Democrats thought this was going to be a, a real wave election by the polls, but it's looking like this was the election we thought was going to happen in 2016, or Democrats thought was going to happen in 2016, where Hillary would win, not by a, a huge amount, but by, you know, a, a solidly comfortable margin nationally, 
And then um, what is looking like a decent electoral college win, there's a lot of states still out and counting, but um, it's looking more positive for, for Biden right now than it, than it is for Trump. So, okay, if Trump doesn't have a, a, a chance of making it at the polls, does he have a chance of making it in the courts? So this was, I think, the overriding concern, or, or maybe not overriding, but this was a major concern of progressives, of Democrats, uh, all throughout um, uh, this election cycle, that Trump would seek to use the powers of the presidency, of the federal, of his of his control of you know being the most powerful person in the world with immense power to deploy federal officers, uh, to deploy the Department of Justice, um, to really uh, make this a contested election in the aftermath. Uh, and we have seen some of that. I think the problem for Trump is for that to have succeeded, it really needed to come down to one state. Now, it still might just come down to Pennsylvania, but the vote counting is proceeding. Um, uh, I think we're it's, it's actually proceeding faster than we thought. Uh, and then you're also seeing pushback from Republicans. People like Mitch McConnell have come out and basically thrown some shade at Trump's effort, as have the former New Jersey governor who's close to uh, Donald Trump, Chris Christie. Uh, and Fox News, uh, in fact, has, uh, I think, played its part in sort of pushing back on some of the more conspiratorial threads that come from the president. Uh, in, a, in an interview this morning um, on one of Trump's favorite shows, there was sort of some pushback against efforts by Trump surrogates to say that there was illegal vote counting. It's just not getting much traction. I think the press aren't pay playing for it. It's also contradictory. Trump in Arizona is saying count, 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 but then trying to stop the count in Pennsylvania because it clearly looks like Pennsylvania is about to have a lot of, of votes for Biden coming in from Philadelphia. So there's no coherent message. Uh, and in some of the legal challenges that they're seeking to pursue, uh, I don't think there's much chance of them uh, occurring. I think the other thing to just consider there is there's no real reason for the Supreme Court to intervene, and it's unclear how they would. This night actually could be seen as quite positive for kind of the conservative establishment Republicans. Looks like they may hold on to the Senate. Uh, and, and so Democratic uh, dreams or efforts to uh, add votes, add uh, seats to the Supreme Court don't really look plausible. So I think it's unlikely, you know, so essentially the conservative control over the court system looks locked in and uh, and also over the Senate. So their ability to stop uh, progressive or, or Democratic efforts legislation locked in. So it, it, I'm not sure you're going to see a lot of conservative overreach here, a lot of Republican overreach. You see, Trump would need the help of a lot of the legal establishment. I'm, I'm doubtful that's going to occur. Wow. You, you almost implied Republicans are decent people. Um, okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm coming to this because this is really important. What you just said last is it, how do we imagine the next two years, the next four years, two years to the midterms, four years in the presidency, assuming that Biden makes it. So, um, how many projects of his of his his essential uh, 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 proposals to rebuild America, uh, recover better? Uh, how much of this will he be able? Will the Democrats be able to actually put into action, given this uh, given the situation that the Senate remains Republican majority, and that possibly after the midterms in 2022. Uh, the the House of Representatives will will have a Republican majority, and then you have like you you have the White House on the one side, and you've got the uh, both houses of Congress on the other, and you've got a very uh, a very Republican friendly Supreme Court. I'm I'm putting it into these neutral terms. Right. No, it's it's a great question, and and I think this is this is what has um, I think caused a lot of angst and anxiety amongst progressives. I think that, you know, job number one for Biden was to just win the election. Um, and uh, he's on the cusp of doing that. And so, you know, I think in some ways he's delivered. On the other hand, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, concern. Um, you know, it's a sort of, you know, we're still in the middle of the game or, or you know, but, uh, you know, Democrats wanted to, <laughs> were, were on Twitter arguing to fire the coach at halftime, which is, you know, a common sentiment uh, for all those who watch sports. Um, but I think there is a sense of, wait, look, 
um, you know, the message uh, pursued by, you know, the, the leadership in the Senate, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, and there's uh, some concern and some a angst growing that maybe this isn't the right leadership team. And I think you're going to see sort of an internal um, argument within the Democratic caucus about about this. You know, it looks like Democrats are going to lose seats in the House. Uh, they were that wasn't projected. The projection was that they were going to gain seats. And I think most consequentially, the Senate, um, it, it, you know, right now you would have to say Democrats look like underdogs to take it. Now, what is likely going to happen, and we're still seeing what's going to play out in Georgia, is that you have to get above 50 percent of the vote in Georgia to avoid a runoff. Uh, David Perdue is on the cusp of that, but looks like he may fall below the 50 percent uh, threshold when all the votes are counted. Um, and so that will lead to two runoff elections that will decide uh, uh, who's going to be in, tr in charge of the Senate, whether it's Democrats or Republicans. That is going to be absolutely critical, uh, those two seats. Now, you would normally say, Dem you know, runoff in Georgia, very unlikely. But Biden's also on the cusp of winning Georgia. So, uh, it looks, you know, that also looks very close. So I think th the major question then is that will Democrats be able to take back the Senate? And if not, then I think you're going to see stalemate. I think on all the sort of major legislation that Democrats were pursuing, I think the hope that Democrats had is that this was going to be a structural change election. This was going to be a wave election, which would allow uh, them to actually fix the Senate, get rid of the filibuster, uh, and do a, a number of structural things, uh, court reform, adding D.C. as a state. These things were, you know, seem sort of radical, but actually were becoming sort of mainstream and we're going to be, I think, a major thrust. And so where we are now is that uh, that doesn't look possible. So we're going to be stuck with the sort of same broken legislative system that really hasn't passed any legislation over the last 10 years. You know, we had Obamacare in 2009 to early 2010. Then we had the Trump tax cuts in the December of 2019. And that's really about it when it comes to major legislation. And so I think that's the place that we're sort of headed because you need the 60 vote threshold. McConnell will control the Senate. Um, and so I think, I think that has real implications uh, for, 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 um, uh, for how politics progress. I think the last point I would just make on this election is it does strike me that this is the end of the road of the kind of Obama uh, era argument. If you go back to 2008, Obama's argument was about, um, about unity. It was about hope that we are not our red states and blue states. That was sort of the same message in 2012. That was Hillary's message in 2016, the stronger together message. And that was Biden's message now, the soul of the nation, that we are, you know, it wasn't an election about economic, um, uh, about bold economic proposals. It was about healing the country. Now, I think that was the right race to run, you know, because this is a must win election and it's hard to try something really new that you don't know whether that's going to persuade working class voters, uh, especially white working class voters that make up Trump's base. However, I think going forward, I think the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren message that is more about economic populism will go to the front of the Democratic message, uh, while the hope, unity, diversity message is going to sort of, I think, take a back seat. Uh, if you think about the convention that uh, Biden had, it was very much about uh, diversity and unity and not so much about economic sort of populism and progressive uh, economic messages. And I think we'll sort of see those reverse um, because I think this is sort of a wake up call for the Democrats that that, you know, it, it's a real problem for them that they're really losing uh, the turnout didn't actually favor them uh, and that the working class vote is is moving away from them. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks, Max. I, I would I would now briefly like to turn to our two Europeans here. Um, Max mentioned the broken system, and and you know I mean first of all this has been a refrain of European thinking and talking about the United States for a long time, but it came again with force in the European commentary uh, about the U.S. presidential uh, and and other elections here. Um, like, not only is the U.S. a divided country, deeply split, very polarized, but also, I mean, this election system is completely unbearable. The world's oldest democracy is not able to count uh, within two days. Uh, and and you, you have heard all this. 
Um, Constantine, let me let me turn to you first. Um, you you are in Boston at the moment. I mean, how do you perceive this as a European? Can you understand the Europeans who feel a tad bit superior because elections are called earlier, votes are counted more effectively, and also maybe uh, um, you know uh, uh, populations are 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 not as diverse as in the states. How, what's your feeling? Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Roland. And uh, yeah, let me uh, give you my take on that, and um, and also uh, make some comments on what Max said. Maybe giving them a, a bit uh, of a different twist. Um, uh, let me start by what um, struck me in this electoral process, and this is participation. I mean, this was a celebration of democracy. I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, people came out in droves in, uh, in a very adverse uh, environment. I mean, we are under a pandemic and, and still, um, you know, you had a huge participation. And it was like, you know, we the people responding to Trump's um, uh, efforts to suppress the vote, to delegitimize the process, talk about uh, fraudulent elections a priori. And, and it was it was very moving the way that American people came out in droves to um, you know to participate and and and, and uh, celebrate democracy. Now the second thing is that um, uh, we I I thought that this would be a sweeping victory or rather a sweeping defeat of Trumpism. This has not happened, and and this is an interesting phenomenon that uh, Trump was able to mobilize people to mobilize his base and be competitive up to the end. And um, and, and and here I would say I mean we we, we uh, it seems that Biden is going to win, but you know it ain't over till the uh, fat lady sings. I mean <laughs> Trump still has a very narrow path to victory. I mean if he holds on to his um, margin in Pennsylvania and Georgia, and he steals Arizona, he still has a very narrow, but he still has a path to victory, which is amazing. Come to think that this is the first president uh, that was so competitive after a war. I mean, we have about 200, a quarter million deaths here in, in the United States, more than we had in Iraq, Afghanistan, into the, in the two wars of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam together. And still, you know, this president proved to be competitive. And going to the, um, to the argument that Marx made about the um, division and, and how the Democrats and the Republicans are going to work in the Senate and, and um, what is happening in the Democratic Party, and, and I think he's absolutely right, there, there, there are already uh, some voices talking about the uh, replacement of Nancy Pelosi and things like that. And also we have to think, we have to note that there seems to have been a defeat of the leftist part, uh, the leftist, the young leftist congressmen and congresswomen uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Democratic caucus, but we still have to, um, to, to, to see all the results coming in. But the, the same question applies to the Republican Party, because it seems that the Republicans made gains under Trump. And, and Trump is, is uh, there's a question about Trumpism. Is Trump is here, here to stay? Um, is it going to be a force after the elections? Uh, what is Trump going to do with, with all his dowry, <laughs> his electoral dowry after the election? Um, what, are the, what is the Republican Party going to do? Is, is, is it going to disassociate itself from Trump or follow some of the, uh, the policies of the uh, Trump administration? So this is a, a, a question that we need to, uh, to respond. Now, uh, the final comment with, uh, with respect to this division and how things are going to work out in, the, um, in, in government, because governing will be a, a very difficult process, especially if the... Uh, if the, if the uh, if the Republicans maintain their uh, lead in the Senate. But here, you know, um, it, it seems that the utility of a Septuagenarian uh, politician of the uh, congressional establishment, which is what Biden is, might be of use to the American political process. Because this is a person, this is a politician that has crossed the aisle many times and he has worked things uh, with the Republican side. And that might, be, might come handy to a Biden administration and, and uh, in, in his effort to, you know, to work with the Republicans and, and, and get, things, uh, uh, get things going. Because 
America still has to face multiple crises. It's a divided country. It's, uh, it has to face a pandemic, an economic crisis, and all these um, uh, structural crises, you know, the, uh, the issue of inequalities, the issue of uh, um, uh, racial injustice, and all the global challenges that, that, we, uh, that we face. So, final point, we saw a celebration of democracy. The electoral process is cubersome. I think we, it's very technical to talk about it. It's a cubersome process. We didn't, saw, we didn't see any frauds. Um, and and just, let me just give you a number. For the last 20 years, almost 250 million Americans have voted through mail-in votes. And according to the Heritage Foundation, which is not a liberal foundation, uh, only about 1,000 votes have been you know, uh, detected as fraudulent. So the electoral system, with all its peculiarities in America, it has worked over the years. And it proves, um, even this time around, that it has, it's, been, it's functional. With all its strange uh, characteristics, I think it's, it's, it's functional. But I think what we need to keep is that, um, the awakening of American democracy. Thanks. Uh, Jana, over to you now. And, and really, I'm, I'm, I'm insisting on this point. I mean, uh, especially in Germany, the, the, America is constantly in free fall. And, and basically, it's, it's, it's turned into a hellhole decades ago already. You know, you wonder how in the German perception it could even get worse, but it is getting worse. So how do you how do you see the reactions of your friends and colleagues in Berlin and of German public opinion and of European perceptions in general about what is going on right now in the States and around Trump, of course. Well, um, first of all, I think it's amazing how closely uh, Germans watch and how interested they are. So uh, there are so many talk shows uh, about this election, radio shows. I mean, I listened to the radio today and it's kind of to this election nonstop. And I think this is amazing uh, if you compare this to kind of how closely we follow, I don't know, the EP elections or something, uh, or the Polish elections. I mean, the French elections maybe are different, but I mean, there are several countries much closer to us and, and we're less interested. So the, the Germans are kind of on fire right now uh, watching um, kind of all, all the developments. But um, yeah, for a while now, and especially in this election, you have seen um, a lot of bewilderment that uh, Germans kind of look at the United States and think, well, the wild hordes are taking over, kind of the country is at the brink of a civil war, or that was before uh, the election place what many expected, that kind of there were books published, the US in mania and, and uh, I um, listened to a lot of uh, discussions about kind of the state of democracy in the US. And I mean, certainly there is some, some reason to, to be worried when you look at Trump and how he kind of attempted to crown himself uh, yesterday. Um, but, but still, um, so there is some sort of complacency, I would say, or schadenfreude. Um, and so the, the Germans feel once again, kind of on, on the better side <laughs> of things and have some yeah, moral high ground here. Um, and so you, you read less about how smooth, uh, smoothly the election was going, that um, nothing really happened, that of course there were some protests, but, but this was not really covered. So sometimes I really wonder if we kind of well, want to see in Trump a kind of the reincarnation of everything that we have ever expected uh, that comes from the United States. Um, what I really liked was the radio silence from the Chancellery. So there was not a public um, statement whatsoever. Um, so I think um, people stayed really calm and said, let them um, kind of keep counting. And so what, what I witnessed here, and I think this is goes beyond Schadenfreude, is that people really, um, and that I think is, is a factor that really weakens American soft power, that it's kind of the United States is not seen as kind of city upon the hill as, yeah, as in, as in kind of the lighthouse of democracy, but yeah, that people here start uh, questioning the whole system. And I mean, it's not without reason, but it's also to an extent that I cannot uh, understand uh, any longer actually. So kind of there is, yeah, I, I think it's there is not a balance uh, in, in coverage. Okay, 
Thanks, Jana. Be before we turn to the to the international implications, let me just for one brief question turn back to Max. Uh, Jana mentioned a beautiful uh, word, the wild hordes. How important was the role of the uh, the Antifa, the, the the BLM riots, the the um, statues toppled, police buildings attacked? When, you know, if you did like me, looking at Breitbart from time to time, you know, a guilty pleasure. Uh, looking at Breitbart News, I mean, pandemonium uh, was their word for what is happened, what has been happening in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, for months already. So how? Big was this factor in getting suburban middle class voters holding their noses and still voting for uh, Trump in this election because simply because they were afraid of the wild hordes, uh, the 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 radical edge of the Democratic Party or of the supporters of the Democratic Party. Let's put it that way. So no, I, I actually I see it a little bit differently. I think. The impact of Black Lives Matter, you could argue, in the protests uh, this summer actually were were positive in an electoral sense um, in winning the suburbs. In that, what it did, and this, what's interesting about this is, it's reminded me a little bit of two of two thousand um, uh, five with Hurricane Katrina. That it wasn't simply the Iraq War that cratered Bush's uh, approval; it was the mishandling of the response to Hurricane Katrina and the, you know, the the real racial disparities on on display there. And I think what what happened this summer was that there was this real recognition, I think, among suburban areas of the country that there's this real problem of racial inequality, and hence they actually sided against uh, Trump sided with Black Lives Matter, but that also caused a counter reaction. And the counter reaction was that in rural areas of the country or uh, less uh, ex-urban, um, there was a, a, a real sense that things are out of control. And I, I think this points just to touch on what Yana pointed out and sort of explaining the, you know, the, the, the hordes of, uh, you know, how could you look at what Trump did over the last four years and still vote for him, especially in the time of COVID? And I think the context to understand this a little bit is both that America is really, you know, it's been split where economic performance in, in metropolitan areas has boomed. You know, Washington, D.C., I've lived there for you know, nearly 20 years. It's not anything like what it was 20 years ago. It's amazing. But rural areas have really stagnated over the last 20 years. You throw into that massive cultural change that is being driven by the cities. You know, the culture wars of the 1990s uh, you know, has completely shifted. American cities are like European cities. But, you know, American rural areas are very religious still. And so there's this real cultural divide. There's also a real racial divide that plays into this. But then also I would just add in the effect of the wars. You know, we've been at war for the last 20 years. And who's been fighting the wars? Well, it's not the progressives like me in the cities. It's more in rural areas. And those wars didn't go well. Uh, in fact, you could call them defeats where we're withdrawing and we're still engaged. And, and so hence war fatigue. And so there's a sense that I think of just wanting to blow up American politics and wanting a populist leader that is an anti-politician. The same sort of feeling that feeds that fed Berlusconi, that feeds the AFD and other populist movements in Europe is this sort of anti-politics. And that is Trump, when he says crazy things, is feeding this anti-politics. And so I think that's what I think Democrats uh, really need to reckon with, is that that vote was really large, that conservative sort of anti-city, anti-establishment, anti-globalist. Um, and so that's where I think, you know, Black Lives Matter really sort of fed into that, but also helped Biden win the suburbs, which I think is going to be decisive. Okay, makes total sense. We've got two questions here concerning the future of the two political parties in the US. Uh, uh, Tommy Huchter, an executive director from of the Martin Center, is asking about the Dems. And Max, you have partly gone into this by saying economically, uh, the Democrats will probably uh, move towards more economic populism. But otherwise, uh, is the party generally shifting more to the center, that would be Biden, or more to the left? And um, the same question, uh, uh, just just with uh, uh, with a different in a different context is about the Republicans uh, by Bartek Kot training in the Martin Center. 
who wants to know about the future of the Republican Party? And really, very, very brief answers. Yes. Yeah. So t t just just to be quick, um, you know, I think the party, is, Democratic Party, is shifting left. And hence, if you look at Biden's economic platform, if you look at Hillary Clinton's economic pa platform, has basically been this real shift to the left. Um, but I think in how they have run has been an emphasis really on on sort of a more unifying and also a diversity message that could keep the co Democratic coalition together. Uh, and, you know, what I, the comments I just made, it does, diversity message plays well both in conservative suburbs and to uh, in, into uh, urban areas. But I think we I think the Democratic Party will try to flip that. Uh, and I think that's going to be the upcoming debate. And I think there's going to be a lot of, of questions about what the direction is. I think just quickly on the Republicans, they have a real problem. Because the question is, you know, yes, they have huge amount of turnout. Yes, they're looking good, you know, in the Senate. But on the other hand, is that just Trump related? Is this Trump a political phenomenon? And can a more sort of traditional politician, uh, some of the others that are trying to emulate Trump, really tap into that? Uh, and really tap in and get those voters energized in off-cycle elections. You know, they didn't do it in, in 2018, I think is a real question. And so there is going to be this, what happens after Trump? I think the hope was that it was going to be that they were going to have to be put into the wilderness and they were going to have to turn away from Trumpism. It doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Uh, but, but whether they can do it without Trump is a big question. Constantine. May I just jump in, uh, uh, Roland? Uh, when it comes to the Democratic Party, I think that uh, this election shows that only a centrist Democratic Party has chances of winning the elections. And I think a lot will depend on the composition of the Congress and especially the Senate. If the, uh, if the Republicans maintain, if they, if they keep the Senate, that will give Biden the alibi that he needs uh, towards the left wing of his party to come to centrist positions and, and centrist policies. So in that sense, uh, we'll have to, um, to see what's going to happen. And one comment in, uh, regarding the previous question about the suburbs. Um, the, we, we do see, and this election is a, is a testament to that, that we, the, the country, as Max said, is very divided. The urban centers, the metropolitan, um, cosmopolitan uh, coastline cities are um, democratic uh, to a large extent, and the rural areas have become Republican. So what was left for the two campaigns to target was the suburbs. And um, this is why, you, I mean, Trump came out with this sexist uh, statement, you know, suburban women uh, vote for me and all that. Uh, but I think you have a point, Roland, when it comes to law and order. I think that Biden would have, would have had a sweeping victory of the suburbs if it wasn't for the way that Trump came out and played the law and order uh, kind of game. So we have to see the results, but my feeling, my gut feeling is that um, the Democrats did not win the suburbs by a landslide as they expected because of the uh, law and orders issue that um, uh, Trump was very effective in, in pushing to the, uh, to the electorate. Great. Okay, well, we've used up half of the time. Let us switch to the main topic today, uh, which is transatlantic relations and the, the impact of this election uh, on them. And, and let me let me start with Jana here. Um, you know, in the 1960s, there was a famous uh, debate within Germany's Christian Democrats between so-called Atlantica and so-called Gullisten. Now, those two terms, especially the, the second term, is not equal to the French meaning and implication of Gullisme, but uh, the, the, the term signified a group of Christian Democrats that wanted to give the first priority in West Germany's, at the time, West Germany's foreign po and security policy to France. Uh, while, of course, still accepting NATO in the transatlantic framework, the emphasis was to be on France. Um, and in, by extension, of course, on European integration. Whereas the other side, the Atlanticists, were putting the main accent on transatlantic relations, obviously NATO, the, Europe, the, 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 the United States. And I, I'm, maybe I'm completely mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but I see this kind of debate in a slightly different form, of course, but re-emerging, it has been re-emerging for some time in the whole of Europe. And this US election, it, it seems to make it all the more urgent. I mean, we had a famous exchange of uh, uh, articles um, uh, between the German defense minister, 
uh, Annegret kramp karrenbauer with uh, representing the Atlanticist camp, uh, and we had a response by, um, I Francisca think, Brandner. Uh, Franziska Brandner, a, a Green a former member of the European Parliament, I think now she's a national member of Parliament, and, it, it, you know, re neatly representing these two worldviews, we've got a lot of voices from France saying like, I told you so. I mean, we've been telling you guys this all the time. Forget about NATO is brain dead. And, you know, we've ha had all this rhetoric in recent months and years. Uh, so, Jana, what is your take on this emerging uh, dichotomy uh, between Atlanticists and more Europeanists, let's call them that way, in, in, yeah. in Germany and in Europe? I, I, I think we saw them emerging after um, the last American election in 2016, um, kind of these two camps, not uh, so much within the Christian uh, Democratic Party, but uh, throughout the, the party spectrum in, in Germany. And I would count the CDU more in the transatlanticist camp. So look, there are basically, yeah, two, you can divide it really into two camps, maybe not along the same lines as in the 60s, but you have one camp arguing that basically it doesn't really matter um, who wins this American election, whoever wins, there are structural changes that have started under Obama or even earlier and that will survive Donald Trump uh, now or in four years. Um, that's the pivot to Asia, the focus of domestic issues, the disengagement from Europe, um, kind of that interests between the EU and the US are drifting apart and um, that we have um, increasingly different values and different interests. And therefore, uh, it's time now to call for a post-Atlanticist Europe, for kind of Europe to cut loose from the United States, to become more independent and to, um, yeah, to, to also um, take more care of kind of our own um, security and to be able to, to, to do kind of things on our own. Um, and that goes along with kind of the desire to have a close relationship with Macron and a strong Europe. Um, the second camp, and these are kind of really kind of stereotypes. There are a lot of people in between, but the second camp says basically, um, yeah, Trump was in a certain sense an aberration. Uh, the United States is still um, kind of uh, indispensable as a Western power, um, the West still matters. Um, and uh, with a President Biden, um, there is a huge chance kind of to, to revive the transatlantic relationship in a meaningful way. We have a lot of in common and kind of the US in Europe is indispensable and we have to keep them engaged in Europe and have to work with them. Uh, we don't have any other options. So one campus must much more attached to the United States and much more also hopeful that the United States has an interest in staying. Um, and this uh, goes um, kind of also along the debate about strategic autonomy uh, in Germany. So one camp um, says, let's maybe not talk that much about strategic autonomy because uh, the US doesn't like it. They think we want to cut loose. We don't want to do this. Um, so maybe let's talk about uh, capacity to act, I think it is, Handlungsfähigkeit, that's what AKK always um, says. And the other camp says, oh, well, we should uh, not shy away from discussions about strategic autonomy because we cannot kind of outsource our security and everything to the United States. They are unreliable. Uh, who knows if in four years time, Ivanka Trump will be president. And uh, if th that's uh, kind of then the, the kind of the new scenario that we are in, which is kind of, yeah. So. so two different camps, two different assessments of the United States, but on substance, and that is why I think this is all a phantom debate, both camps basically agree that the Europeans need to do more, that they need to have better capabilities, that they have to bring much more to the table, either kind of for the EU defense and to boost EU defense, or uh, because kind of the US is interested in a strong European partner. And there's so much energy going into this debate right now. And so many op-eds are written and I think this is all nonsense because I think basically it's about us doing more in whatever context. And yeah, so I think it's a bit of a waste of time, actually. Okay, us doing more. I mean, we're doing more of the talking. Uh, yes. I certainly, I certainly can confirm that. But is there, ever, <laughs> is there ever going to be action to follow this up? And and you know, to take it even a little bit further, is you know how how can Europe? 
even remotely replace something like the extended nuclear deterrence by the United States um, with instruments of its own. You know, and th there is a question of, of still existing nation states when it comes to nuclear weapons. I think, uh, you know, if I was Estonian, I wouldn't necessarily rely on, on uh, la force de dissuasion uh, of the French Republic as a guarantee for my security. Um, and, and the other thing is the money, I mean, you know, even discounting the, the, the COVID-19 induced economic slump, I, I mean, people are saying that Europe as a whole, all European Union member states would have to go to somewhere between four and six percentage points of their GDP if they wanted to fully make up for the, the whole uh, uh, a spectrum of uh, deterrence that they get from NATO and the United States, from strategic nuclear to tactical nuclear to conventional to hybrid. So, I mean, this is completely utopian. It's not going to happen. So, so I mean, where is this European uh, strategic autonomy going to come from? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you that we can all agree on Europe has to do more, but will it ever do even remotely sufficient uh, things for for to, to take care of our own security, to take things into our own hands. Well, you are preaching a bit to the converted here because um, I think that, uh, of course, um, the United States is uh, indispensable in the medium term because we don't have enough capabilities in Europe and you mentioned kind of the nuclear dimension. And I mean, the European member states cannot even agree on kind of the European peace facility right now or kind of uh, the strategic compass and what is the threat and what isn't uh, and priorities. So um, yeah, I think we are still a huge mess in Europe, but um, and, and th these are certainly blind spots in this Francisca Brandner op-ed. So she says the United States is unreliable and we have to focus on the EU. And the, the, the truth is, I mean, we have been focusing on the EU uh, and if we would implement everything that was agreed in the EU framework since 2016 or earlier, uh, or I mean, in the 2000s, when we talked about headline goals and all this, and 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 no action followed. So the theory is all there. Um, the practice um, is lacking. At the other hand, I think um, our AKK in Germany got also some critique by saying, yeah, yeah, but uh, there is some truth in this argument that uh, kind of elections have become volatile and that basically Trump stands for a completely different foreign policy um, outlook and that maybe um, we need to think of a plan B or a plan uh, A and a half and think about um, how, how can we organize this better. Um, but I think there is no contradiction between uh, a strong transatlantic ties and more European action. And I think there is, I mean, Biden, if he will be elected, will come to us and ask, okay, what can you put uh, to the table? I'm focused on China. Uh, we have this Russia threat. What are you going to do about this? And I think this is totally justified. And, and um, so I think we cannot, as Europeans, get away with kind of free riding and just talking any longer. So um, I, I'm with you that we have been uh, quite a failure so far. Um, and I don't want to cut loose from the United States, certainly not. But um, yeah, I think we should we should actually really rethink how we can boost European defense. Absolutely. Well, Constantine, I, I will I will get to you in a second, but I just want to briefly turn back to Max and Max ask you. Um, the Trump administration has uh, voiced, of course, the the old U.S. complaint about burden sharing and the Europeans aren't doing enough and so on, but. You know, as soon as it gets to some concrete things like the European Defense Fund, uh, there have been massive protests and, and, and uh, you know, uh, statements of displeasure uh, from the Department of Defense and the White House and others in Washington. How would that continue or not under a President Biden? But what would be the attitude to these concrete steps where Europeans are trying to take more responsibility, but that sometimes means some form of, you know, if you, if you want to get more independent, you need to decouple to some extent, right? And if it's only for the arms industry. So how would a Biden administration look at this? Yeah, in some ways, it's not just the Trump phenomenon. I, you know, I think a lot of that did occur under Democratic administrations, under the Bush, the Bush administration, where 
Europeans, you know, we would say do more on defense. And then Europeans are like, how about this EU idea? And we're like, no, 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 anything but that. Uh, and my hope is that that will change. Uh, I think the Trump administration was sort of uniquely hostile, just given the influence of the um, arms industry. The I ironic thing about this, and as someone who worked on U.S. security cooperation at the State Department for a number of years, is that never once did I really hear any of the top heads of U.S. Uh, uh, weapons companies or arms companies ever really mention Europe uh, or complain about EU efforts. I think this is just when you can, when they had a full door open to sort of lobby uh, the Trump administration on everything, this be, became uh, a, an abiding concern. But my, my hope is actually that the U.S. sort of goes back and, and sort of brushes off where we were in the kind of the 19, early 1950s, when the United States was very much supportive of European integration. We were supportive of the European defense community. It was, you know, something we really you know, backed and, and used our in uh, our clout and leverage to get European countries to sign up. You know, there's a, fr a French idea and then the French parliament uh, rejected it uh, in the end after, after a treaty was agreed to. Um, and then I think we just sort of shift focus. I think since the 90s, U.S. has been all, uh, essentially a NATO focused uh, NATO, NATO has been all consuming in Washington, but I think there's a sense now that uh, we really need Europe to get its act together and that the, the EU isn't a threat. I think Brexit was actually a, a, a real eye opener here in Washington that because it came you know, right before Trump and it was this sense, oh my gosh, uh, the European Union is actually critical to the United States. And so we need to figure out ways to support the EU. It's not a prop, uh, a competitor to the United States. And in fact, when Europe does sort of disagree with the US on, uh, on big policy issues, maybe it has a point, such as on the Iran deal, such as on the Iraq war. Uh, and so European strategic autonomy, my hope, is the Biden administration would actually really seek to cultivate it and seek to encourage Europe to do more. Uh, and I think the European overall, the European strategy over the last four years is just basically to wait out Trump, to have summits that don't do anything, that avoid conflict. And, you know, there hasn't been a lot of action. And I, my hope is that uh, the U.S. says, oh, yeah, you need to actually do the things you should have been doing the last four years because we don't know what will happen going forward. We could have another administration that isn't pro-EU. So um, so that that's where I hope they come down. Max, you don't you, you don't even know how good it feels to listen to this uh, as a European <laughs> after four years of what we got. Constantine, um, uh, you know, I, I was I, I already threatened you guys with being Matt Karnichnik. So uh, this Austrian American journalist um, uh, uh, wrote a, a, a Politico uh, op-ed this morning where he said that, look, whoever wins the U.S. election, the loser is already clear. It's going to be Europe. And why? Because uh, even if Biden wins, the tone may get a little bit um, friendlier, but the differences in substance on security, on defense, on trade, on China uh, will remain. And the fact that the tone is friendlier is even more dangerous because the Europeans will get complacent and they will feel that they can go back to sleep and nothing positive is going to happen. And then we're, we're all going to wake up in 2024 with Ivanka Trump uh, or, or, or Donald Jr. <laughs> president. OK, I'm you know, I'm, I know it's a nightmare scenario. <clears throat> Constantine, what's your take on this? Well, yes, and no. Um, uh, in, in, in the sense that, um, you know, under Trump, transatlantic relations have hit rock bottom. And the second Trump term, uh, it would have been catastrophic for transatlantic relations uh, because his mannerism, uh, his behavior, his bombastic rhetoric, his policies, everything was catastrophic. And, you know, in politics, um, I, I was listening to Biden in one of the debates and he talked about international relations and he, he said about, it's all about relations. At the time, I thought it was quite simplistic. But it is about relations. I mean, Tip O'Neill used to say that all politics is local, but also politics is personal. And to that extent, I think Biden will bring transatlantic relations back to normalcy. I think that um, his approach will be more multilateral. I think that we are not going to be operating under the uh, stress that NATO might be, um, uh, you know, dismantled under a second Trump administration. 
But having said all that, there is no question about it, Ron, that there are structural changes happening in both sides of the, of, of the Atlantic. In, in the United States, interest in Europe is declining. You see that in the universities. I was in the United States from 80 to 95, and there was a great interest in Europe. You, you can't find that interest anymore. You don't get European students. You don't get American students that are interested in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, you don't see, um, you know, the foreign policy establishment now is focusing on China. There is no, the, you don't see a lot of European immigration to the United States to sustain the interest in Europe. So you, you, you have structural changes. And of course, you know, with the decline of, um, with the dismantling of the Soviet Union, with Russia being a declining power and with the rise of China, there is a refocusing of, of the United States. But I would come to back to what Jana said, to which I, I totally agree that, you know, we, what we can expect from a Biden administration is that we can have, of course, the issues of burden sharing will, will still be on the table. Of course, the Americans will ask the Europeans to do more about um, defense and contribute more to defense and so on and so forth. But we, I think we can strike a balance. And from you know strategic dependence to strategic autonomy, there is a wide uh, spectrum to be covered. And we can talk about strategic complementarity. We can talk about a better division of labor between the two sides of the Atlantic. And I think with the Biden administration, we have a better chance of, of, of achieving that. Yeah, who could disagree with this? OK, China has been mentioned. It's also something that our audience is interested in. Uh, so the, the last question to all three of you uh, with, with brief answers, if possible. Um, how is Euro-American cooperation on or conflict about relations with China going to look like in the next couple of years? Um, uh, you know, and again, the devil may actually be in the detail. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that that all European governments are ready to, for example, cut Huawei out of the buildup of their 5G networks. Uh, and yet, this is something that allegedly is consensual. It's 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 one of the last bipartisan consensus things in Washington. Uh, is actually that uh, you know the the, the 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 Chinese U.S. confrontation is coming. Um, so my question to all three of you: How is this going to be handled um, uh, in transatlantic relations in the future? Uh, and maybe also, I mean, to what extent is this just a a geopolitical contest between Beijing and Washington where the EU has to place itself somewhere? Or is this democracies versus authoritarianism? Max, yeah, Jana, you, you'll come right, right after this. And then Max first. So I, so I think there's been a recognition that uh, on both sides, that China is sort of the, uh, you know, the major geopolitical challenge for the United States. Now, there's a debate within Washington over, you know, how, um, how to actually, you know, is this sort of a new Cold War 2.0, or is this some something different? And I'm, you know, I think there's there's a range of views. But what I, I think the general point I would make to uh, a European crowd is that uh, that focus on China doesn't not mean a focus on Europe. In fact, I think it actually, the focus on China is actually going to be very good for transatlantic relations because there's a recognition in the United, in Washington that the U.S. isn't quite as powerful as it was and that China is very much a, you know, a powerful uh, country, a rising power, uh, and that we need allies. And so we need to be working with Europe on all sorts of issues like 5G, like trade, like climate. But then also, uh, but then the other element is that Europe's a, a, a theater of geopolitical competition between the US and China, between democracies and autocracies. And there is great concern over China's you know, 16 plus one, its efforts to build relations within Europe. Um, so I actually think that China is something that will animate Washington's interest in Europe. And then just to make maybe a quick side point, um, I do think that one of the things that a new Biden administration will come to Europe and say, let's get to work. And I do think that one of the things that Europeans, that EU in particular needs to think about is that if you have an American administration that can't pass sort of domestic laws on climate change, on, uh, on uh, regulating tech companies, for instance, we will need to work with Europe to in effect regulate the American market. 
on tech companies. So I think you're going to have a change in attitude in the US where how can we use the regulatory power of Brussels to help us deal with Facebook, Google, to deal with climate change. So I think that's just something that folks need to think about in Europe and, and create constructive ideas to come uh, to hopefully what will be a new Biden administration in January. Max, we're only too willing to help. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think actually China could become a unifying factor in the transatlantic relationship because I think that there has been some rethinking in Europe. I mean, not all over Europe, as you mentioned, um, Uland, but um, I mean, it's not that bad. Uh, Europeans have realized that China has been meddling um, or trying to meddle in internal EU affairs, has trying to um, kind of intervene in uh, voting procedures uh, in the UN context using Greece or Hungary as kind of Trojan horses. Um, and when it comes to, um, yeah, looking at China, I mean, we Europeans have a problem with uh, reciprocity. Um, we have a problem with copyright uh, violations um, and also on the, on the kind of security or value base. And we have a problem with what's going on in Hong Kong or Taiwan or the Uyghurs. So I think there is a lot of uh, things that we share, interests and values, and that we think or we look at China in a different way than a couple of years ago. The problem is how, what to do about it. And so what the Europeans don't uh, want to do is kind of decouple from China. This is, I think, the big problem that China um, is, that, that kind of we are so much intertwined that this is something that is very difficult from a European perspective. So what I think the European hope would be that Biden would less um, go for decoupling and also more for finding solutions in international or multilateral frameworks uh, on China and not to do to deal with China so much bilaterally. But I think we could come together, certainly. I mean, the Germans need to move uh, a lot. Just, I leave it here. Uh, Germany needs Great. to yeah. get rid of its business interests. I wish, we had, I wish we had more time on this. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Constantine, one minute on, on the China question. Three very quick points, because I basically agree with whatever has been said by Jana and Max. Let me add three things. Number one, I think we were very slow in Europe to understand that China is a strategic rival. And Jana was right that um, China was very smart in bypassing Brussels and striking bilateral agreements with uh, nation state, member states like uh, Greece, Italy, Hungary, and so on and so forth. Secondly, I think the American approach by pivoting to Asia is um, an old geopolitical approach that doesn't work. I mean, in the sense that you cannot give to a global challenge a, a, a regional response. Because while uh, America is pivoting to Asia, China is pivoting to Europe. So in that sense, I think unity of the transatlantic space is of essence because the West needs to pivot to Eurasia. And, and we have to have a unitary response to China. And final point, what you said about democracy and uh, versus authoritarianism. This is a very, very uh, pivotal point. We, uh, the Trump administration was very transactional in, in its approach. It never uh, talked about human rights or democracy. I think, I, I believe, I expect the Biden administration and we, the Europeans, should focus on issues of human rights, democracy, uh, when it comes to all these uh, you know, onslaught of authoritarians by China, by Russia, by Turkey, and so on and so forth. All right. Well, we, we, it's, it's, it's getting almost boring, so it's time to wrap up. Because we all agree here. Um, so five takeaways would be, first of all, we're probably looking at a Biden win. Second, there is no such thing as a democratic wave, which is fundamentally going to re, redo American politics. Uh, and there will be divided government, and that will probably prevent many of the projects um, of the Democrats. But nevertheless, some some cooperation with a possibly slightly more rational Republican Party might be possible. We'll we'll we'll, we'll see about that. Third, uh, in transatlantic relations with a President Biden, the tone would much improve, but not only the tone, also the substance. Um, fourth. Europe, in any case, has to do more for its own security. And whatever debate we're going to have about a more Atlanticist or a more Europeanist orientation of European security policy, we have to shape up, we have to get our act together. Uh, and fifth, I think the buzzword, the, the, the magical formula, uh, was Konstantin's um, strategic complementarity with the United States. 
It doesn't mean that Europe and the US, under pre, even under President Biden, do exactly the same thing and see eye to eye on everything. They won't. But they can at least coordinate who does what and what needs to be the consensual core of our policies and, of course, our, our approach to global democracy and a common approach to China and on which questions we may actually go slightly different ways or use different instruments. And uh, I, think, I think that should leave us with a slightly optimistic view of transatlantic relations after this memorable U.S. election that all of us will remember for the rest of our lives. Thank you very much. Thanks for debating. Thanks to all of you for watching. And see you again, hopefully soon, hopefully in person. Stay safe, stay at home. Bye.